Imagine a landscape where wildlife can share our world, where the sights and sounds of nature are part of everyday life. The vision for living seas and living landscapes drives today's wildlife trust movement. But for a century, it has championed nature. From early pioneers to latter-day conservationists, the wildlife trusts have inspired millions to know and love the living world. I think the trusts are in better heart than they have ever been in my experience. Uh, there are more people there. Uh, they're better organized. They're more effective. They have a, a louder voice in parliament uh, and in governmental things. Uh, I think the trusts are in very good heart, um, which is as well, because uh, the, the, the dangers are greater than ever. In the early 20th century, land management was changing fast. Urban development and advances in agriculture were starting to put pressure on the natural world. A young Charles Rothschild, naturalist and banker, watched the marshes and fens of eastern England change beyond measure. One of the last fragments, Wood Walton Fen, was at risk. I think Rothschild recognized that um, some places simply needed to be preserved because, and, and as it were, taken out of development, that we were to see them as something precious in their own right. Rothschild knew that losses were occurring at a rapid pace. He saved Wood Walton from being drained for agriculture. But Rothschild's wider vision to protect Britain's natural habitats marks the beginning of nature conservation as we know it today. This is the boardroom of the Natural History Museum. And it was here in May 1912 that the first ever meeting of the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves was held. Charles Rothschild would have been in the chair and he had his colleagues around him, most of them scientists, naturalists. And this is where it all began. Rothschild's new Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves adopted a vigorous approach to conservation. Rothschild had a lot of influential friends. He knew a lot of landowners. He's from the wealthy aristocracy. And um, he set about, as it were, surveying the British Isles and looking at places that he felt were uh, uniquely worthy of, of preservation. And if we look at his map of 284 sites, I think it was now, it's astonishing to see the, the sophistication of his vision. He knew just which bits we needed. We needed representations of lowland heath and um, raised peat bogs of ancient woodland, of Caledonian pine forest, of marshes, uh, and so on. It was extraordinary. I mean, many of the places which he selects are nature reserves now. Government had not yet accepted the need for nature conservation. But others had begun to share Rothschild's vision. In 1926, part of the North Norfolk coast came up for sale. And the Norfolk Naturalists Trust was formed. And it was founded with the purpose of protecting, preserving in, in Rothschild's sense, the Cly Marshes, which were threatened with other kinds of development. And a wide group got together and said, no, this, this is very special, this place. We must, we must keep it. And looking back, that probably has the flavor of the first wildlife trusts as we know them today. What did the Second World War bring for nature conservation? Surprisingly, as early as 1940, the government was already planning for a better, brighter post-war Britain. 
the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves would play a crucial role. There was a move to consider nature conservation, and there were these two or three classic meetings in the Moses Room in the House of Lords. And I really think that's quite remarkable that at a time when the war was going pretty badly for the Allies, nevertheless, they began to plan for a conservation strategy in Britain. The Moses Room meetings led to a series of forceful reports on nature conservation in Britain. Coordinated by the SPNR, Regional committees gathered lists of proposed statutory nature reserves. Government action was needed. Wildlife was facing increasing pressure. At the end of the war, the British countryside changed in a, in a revolutionary and radical way. The, the pattern of the landscape of the 30s, of, of little patchwork fields with hedges around them and so on, uh, that had to disappear and did disappear during the war when growing food for ourselves. Uh, was of national importance. Despite these changes, a conservation strategy for Britain was in place. Government would establish national nature reserves, sites of special scientific interest, and the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act became law in 1949. But an act alone was not enough local action was urgently needed. The Lincolnshire Trust already manages about 2,000 acres and more than 20 reserves. Ted Smith, Arthur Edward Secretary Smith, Trust, known as Ted Smith, filmed here in 1967, was a post-war pioneer of nature conservation. He helped found the Lincolnshire Trust in 1948 and was to play an important role in the SPNR's future too. Um, now in his 90s, no trust could have had a more dedicated champion than Ted Smith. But he was also to play a crucial role in the development of the trust movement as a whole. And there were half a dozen of us by the middle 50s, half a dozen trusts, and we got together and decided that we wanted some kind of uh, national body. We wanted our independence. It's important to keep local autonomy. This is a movement very much motivated and run by local people. Um, but we needed a, a body which would help, which would advise, which would look for funding from national sources, uh, which would represent our views and speak for us at national level and so on. Um, and so we went to the SPNR and said, you know, can we come in? The Wildlife Trust's movement was underway and staged its first national conference in 1960. So the Trust organised a conference. Lincolnshire hosted it at Skegness and at Gibraltar Point. I didn't realise it was going to make headlines, but that was just a statement of what the Trust wanted from a national body. And the movement suddenly snowballed. I mean, within three years, there were 36 trusts. Within a few more years, the whole country was covered. This explosion in trust membership meant that the message of nature conservation was reaching a wider public. Never was their support more needed. Trusts enlisted the support of local people to rescue meadows and moorland wetland and woodland across the UK. A local fundraising campaign meant that the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Trust could acquire Warburg Nature Reserve in 1968 to preserve its ancient woodland and chalk grassland. Newly acquired reserves offered the chance to improve habitats and study wildlife in greater detail. The society worked closely with the local trusts to coordinate campaigns improve legal protection for wildlife, and ban pesticides. A name change to the Royal Society for Nature Conservation also brought each trust a seat on the board. And the movement was about to expand further. The mission to engage children with nature has been one of the defining aims of the Wildlife Trust movement. Watch is the Society's club for young people. 
Watch involves its young members in caring for wildlife and the environment. The club magazine, Watch Word, is packed full of ideas. Kids at that age are little sponges for information and uh, you, you can catch their interest so easily. Does anyone know, can anyone guess maybe, how many different species of tree there are in the world? In other words, we were injecting, what I was saying, the business of understanding leads to concern and then to love, which is what it's all about. Meanwhile, new groups were springing up to protect urban wildlife and provide an opportunity for people to connect to nature near their homes and workplaces. The Urban Wildlife Group began in Birmingham in 1981. And soon trusts were formed in Avon, Cleveland, Sheffield and London. Armies of keen young volunteers energised the movement with their desire to create and maintain a healthy environment and they were prepared to fight for it. The Wildlife Trust's work was boosted in the 90s by new heritage lottery funding, bringing on board more staff and allowing new reserves and visitor centers to be acquired. The Otters and Rivers project was a large scale example of trusts working with landowners to manage habitats, in this case for the otter and other wetland wildlife. The new look Badger logo also heralded a name change to the Wildlife Trusts. Attention also began to turn to the marine environment. The Trusts lobbied MPs and the Petition Fish campaign also played a part in getting a Marine Act passed in 2009. The Trust movement was fast becoming a leading force in marine conservation. And now the Living Seas campaign reminds us that we have for too long, assumed the abundance of our oceans was limitless. The marine ecosystem is vulnerable and needs time to recover. Protecting the sea's wildlife is incredibly urgent. We, we really have got to get it right in the next 10 years. Uh, we just owe it to future generations. Now we've realised and recognised the full extent of the problem that we've got to turn it around and put it very quickly, much quicker than we have on land. We have to turn that problem round. Yorkshire Wildlife Trust are monitoring seabird numbers on their reserve at Flamborough Head and surveying parts of the North Sea to ensure the right marine protected areas can be in place. Cornwall Wildlife Trust are also playing a leading part in the Living Seas campaign. These volunteer divers are being taken on a dive in the Fal estuary to search for seaweeds which inhabit inshore waters. The divers spend an hour underwater. What they can identify today will help others protect for tomorrow. For the Wildlife Trusts, recovery of the seas goes hand in hand with recovery of the landscape. In 2006, the Wildlife Trusts published A Living Landscape, a report which captured the movement's ambition for nature's recovery. It's a new era for nature conservation. Urgent action now will secure a better long-term future for wildlife and people. It means managing land beyond refuge nature reserves, so wildlife can extend its range and more easily adapt to the challenge of climate change. Lobbying by the trusts led to the government commissioning a major report making space for nature in 2010. John Lawton chaired the panel. On this side, Ascombe Bog, we're seeing what nature conservation has been, which is to take an existing site uh, that is extremely important for nature, uh, putting a fence around it, basically, and looking after it. But we know that that strategy hasn't worked to the extent it should have worked because we're still losing species, plants and animals uh, at, a, at a really quite alarming rate across the English countryside. So the only the thing that we need is a step change, a major step change, so that we begin to restore nature. And what we want the, to do now is to have the government recognise that society needs nature to be put back where we've lost it. We want to effectively have 
1949 Act, but for nature's recovery. And that's where I think the trusts are at. We're saying, are we going to sit around on the goal line and defend the lead we've secured over the last 9,900 years? Or are we going to go out there now, as Rothschild and Ted Smith and Herbert Smith would have wanted us to do, and say it's not good enough, actually. We need to put nature back in its rightful place. And our belief is if we can inspire enough people with the vision of a living landscape, then it will be obvious that we must protect what we've currently got. The Wildlife Trusts are enjoying one of the most exciting periods in their history, with trusts across the UK, the Isle of Man and Alderney. But Simon King believes there is still work to be done. I think one of the greatest dangers that face the natural world in the British Isles is apathy. And whilst I am very lucky to be president at a time when there are lots of positive initiatives, when the trusts right around Britain are driving forward with all of this fabulous energy and positive rhetoric, there is a danger in people generally thinking that someone else is doing it. They're not. And so, no, we can't sit back on any laurels. We all have to get up, we have to lend our voice to the natural world, and we have to get behind it so that we ultimately are the beneficiaries.